Good evening, everyone. I'm Lynn Fridley, Program Coordinator for Maddie's Institute. The topic of our webcast is Cracking the Infection Control Code, Using and Interpreting Diagnostic Tests to Control Infectious Diseases in Shelters. At Maddie's Institute, we are committed to helping you find innovative, humane, and effective ways to keep animals happy and healthy while preparing them for placement in a new home. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Ronald Schultz, the founder and chair of the Department of Pathobiological Science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Veterinary Medicine. He was the first president of the American Association of Veterinary Immunologists, as well as a member of a number of veterinary vaccine task forces, including the American Animal Hospital Association's Canine Vaccine Task Force, and the American Association of Feline Practitioners Feline Vaccine Task Force. Dr. Schultz also heads up Maddie's Laboratory for, diagnos for Diagnosis and Prevention of Shelter Diseases, where he's putting his experience and knowledge to work helping America's homeless dogs and cats. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping items that we need to cover. First, ten audience members will be chosen in a random drawing for a door prize. Each will receive a copy of Maddie's Infection Control Manual. We will contact the winners via email, so good luck. Next, please take a look at the left-hand side of your screen where you'll see a Q&A window. That's where you will ask questions during the event. Dr. Schultz will answer as many as he can at the end of the presentation. But please submit your questions early. Questions submitted in the last few minutes will not be processed in time for a response. If you need help with your connection during the presentation, you can click on the question mark, which is the help icon at the bottom of your screen. There are other little images along with the help button. These are called widgets. The two green file widgets will take you to the resources that our presenter wanted to share with you, as well as some from Maddie's Institute. The resources will also be available on our website after this presentation. So don't worry if you don't get a chance to review them during the event. Before I turn things over to Dr. Schultz, I want to say a few words about Maddie's Fund. We are the nation's leading funder of shelter medicine education, and it is our goal to help save the lives of all of our nation's healthy and treatable shelter dogs and cats. The inspiration for that goal was a little dog named Maddie who shared her unconditional love with Dave and Cheryl Duffield. They promised her that they would honor that love by founding Maddie's Fund and helping make this country a safe and loving place for all of her kind. Please use what you learn here tonight to make the dream she inspired a reality. Dr. Schultz, thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Lynn, for that introduction. And I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome all of you to this presentation this evening. Thank you for coming, and also to thank Maddie's Fund for the many contributions that they're making to shelter medicine. And uh, we're going to really focus this evening on uh, some important tools that we have for disease outbreak investigation and controls. And uh, we'll start by talking about observations and what I mean by observations, it's your uh, clinical skills and the observation that you make within that shelter to see what the uh, things are like, how things are going, and uh, whether there are any uh, potential problems that are, are developing. And so being aware is uh, critically important. Once we have a problem develop, then we have to consider what kind of diagnostics we have available for testing to determine what disease or diseases might be causing the problem. Frequently, uh, that can uh, be made almost through observation, but more often than not, to confirm those observations or those clinical impressions we need to have these diagnostics available. And then we also, of course, uh, will talk about how we might be able to treat and 
how in the future <clears throat> we might be able to uh, prevent. So that's really the basis of the discussion that we'll have this evening. And so I want to talk a little bit about the different types of diagnostics. And there's really two basic methods that these diagnostics use. Uh, one is uh, often used for the detection of immunity, and that would be especially through methods that detect antibody. And it might be antibody to a specific pathogen uh, that we are concerned that's causing some disease. Uh, another type of uh, detection method is a detection of antigen, and that's uh, frequently designed to look at the agent that might be contributing to the outbreak. Uh, and very recently, we have uh, technologies that now look for the nucleic acid of a potential pathogen, virus, bacteria. Uh, in general, uh, it would be one of those two, although we could even be looking at a parasite or something else. But uh, detection of antibody, usually immunity is what we're looking for there, but there are exceptions. And I think that many of you in the audience know that when you do a test to look for the feline immune deficiency virus, we're really looking at antibody in the animal. And the reason we can do that is antibody and infection are synonymous in a feline immune deficiency virus infection. In contrast, and we'll be talking more about this as we go along, antibody to something like canine distemper is not necessarily an indication of infection. It is more likely an indication of immunity or protection. So that's important with regard to the diagnostics and what we're uh, really trying to measure. And then the method of detection, we'll uh, discuss that in more detail, but there are a variety of different methods for uh, detection. Now, the, the antigen detection, as you can uh, see in the slide under two, we can be looking, uh, of course, for nucleic acid and when we are, uh, that happens to uh, be one of the newer types of techniques. So we can get into those methods of uh, detection of antigen. And uh, the immunologic techniques, antigen capture, and it's usually an antigen capture ELISA. And here we use as an example the feline leukemia virus test. This could be the, uh, the combo test that you probably run frequently. In this instance, there's actually an antibody that captures the feline leukemia virus if it's there, and that, of course, then will give you a positive result. So in this instance, we're really looking at the infectious agent. Same thing if you're uh, using something like the IDEX uh, fecal parvovirus SNAP test. That's also, of course, capturing that parvovirus so that it can be detected if it's there. And uh, that's an important uh, tool. Both of these are important tools, and probably many of you, many of you use them on, uh, if not a daily basis, certainly on a, a weekly basis. And as I've already mentioned, that uh, immunologic technique that looks for antibody, uh, we'll be looking at that all for two purposes, to detect the agent or to determine whether or not the animal is immune to, uh, to that agent. With regard to the molecular techniques, the PCR test is uh, really becoming quite uh, popular. Uh, for detection, mainly because of the many advantages that that particular technique can bring uh, to the detection of agents that are involved in an outbreak. And so 
just as examples, uh, we've got uh, detection methods for uh, most, if not all, of the potential pathogens that we would be dealing with in dogs and cats now uh, possible to detect using the polymerase chain reaction. This is uh, often referred to as the RT, reverse transcript reverse transcriptase PCR, polymerase chain reaction. Uh, the thing that uh, we'll talk about as we go along, this technology is new enough, and especially where it's being used in an environment uh, like the uh, shelter, that uh, we still have a lot of things that we have to look at because we're not always sure what that positive result may really uh, indicate, especially in a recently vaccinated animal. We may not be recognizing the agent that's causing the disease. We may actually just be picking up the replication of the vaccine virus. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that as we move along. Uh, but. Surely this particular test will play a much greater role uh, probably in the future than it even does now. The other thing is that it doesn't always tell you there's an infectious agent that's uh, present. Uh, it uh, may well uh, just indicate that the nucleic acid is there and that animal may actually be um uh, not infectious, uh, even though we, we detect the agent. Well, we have a poll question, Dr. Schultz, um, and this is for the audience. Uh, please answer, uh, does your organization use PCR tests as a diagnostic tool? And the answers are, yes, we love it, yes, but we still, we're still confused about how to interpret the results sometimes, no, We'd like to, but we can't afford the tests. No, we don't see a lot of disease uh, to warrant testing and not applicable. So submit your answers, um, and we'll look at the results in just a second. I think this is a pretty interesting question, and we can get a feel for what's going on out there in the shelter world. So we're going to look at the <coughs> results. Um, there they are, Dr. Schultz. What do you think? Well, it looks like uh, we've got uh, people using it. They like it. Uh, don't be the least bit uh, concerned if you are still confused uh, because we're really sorting things out with regard to how to interpret some of the information. And uh, it is an expensive test, and we'll talk more about that. That is one of the major disadvantages. And there are attempts being made to uh, make the test less costly by developing a little bit different uh, measures uh, than we have right now. And uh, I really uh, applaud the, the group that aren't uh, seeing much disease. That's great. Uh, so, and then for the group where this is not applicable, uh, you're probably not involved as much in the uh, shelter situation where diseases are occurring. So let's get back to the diagnostics and the methods to detect antibody infection or immunity. And uh, with regard to antibody, these tests are probably familiar to most of you because they are the standard, uh, gold standard kinds of tests. Uh, virus neutralization test, uh, ser often referred to as serum neutralization test uh, because uh, of being uh, applicable to things other than virus. But these are critically important for uh, determining whether an animal has immunity, for example, the distemper or uh, Khaleesi virus. We'll talk a little bit more about that or herpes virus, adenovirus, so virus neutralization, hemagglutination inhibition, another way of measuring antibody. The virus neutraliz neutralization usually has a little bit more correlation 
with protection because it is um, an in vitro test that actually measures the uh, inactivation or uh, killing or blocking of that virus from infecting. Hemagglutination inhibition also for the parvoviruses and for uh, influenza virus, for example, CIV is canine influenza, hemagglutination inhibition does correlate pretty well with uh, protection uh, from those particular diseases. Agglutination, uh, some of you are familiar with the microscopic agglutination test that's used for the diagnosis of leptospirosis. Often, as I said earlier, antibodies are used to look for protection, but they are also used to determine whether or not that animal uh, is infected. And this is an example. The microscopic agglutination test really doesn't measure protection against lepto. It tells you whether or not that animal is infected or not and can even tell you uh, that it might be infected by a particular serovar based on the antibody titer to that serovar. ELISA is probably the most commonly used technology in most of our uh, on-site type tests that uh, you can do right in the shelter. And so ELISA plays a very key role in both agent detection as well as antibody detection. And then fluorescence plays a role too uh, with certain pathogens. That happens to be a very useful test. And I know there's probably only limited testing, if any at all, for Lyme disease or Borrelia burgdorferi infection in shelter animals, but uh, the tests that are available uh, can tell you whether or not there's protective immunity or the animal's infected or not infected, and whether it's a persisting or long-term infection or an acute infection. So there's some real uh, opportunities with these various tests. Now, with regard to the polymerase chain reaction, uh, <clears throat> many shelters and uh, also practices are having samples tested by this method now. Uh, as I indicated before, it is an excellent test. It has a high sensitivity and specificity, uh, but it is new, and some of the quality control standards <clears throat> and some of the questions uh, about what uh, does it mean if the animal is positive and the animal had just been vaccinated within the last week or two. Uh, are there uh, certain ways of shipping samples, uh, the samples that go for PR, <coughs> PCR testing, do they have to be handled in, in any particular way? And these are, are questions that <coughs> need to be answered. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, where can you get the testing done? Well, uh, commercially IDEX Laboratories uh, is really providing uh, a number of canine and feline uh, tests. And so I'm sure that some of you that are using the test are using IDEX Lab. But uh, there are also state diagnostic labs that are providing the test. And so that's um, something that you want to check uh, and see whether or not those tests are available through your state diagnostic labs. Not all of them provided uh, this test yet. And then <clears throat> interpretation of results. Cost, uh, yes, it is uh, a costly test. And, and what do I mean by that? Uh, how much should you expect to pay? Well, if you were looking, for example, at samples in a there was a single sample, and you wanted to know if that sample uh, have, happened to have uh, distemper virus in it. You could be paying anywhere from 40 to $60 for that one test. But there are also uh, tests where they multiplex, and multiplex means that on that sample they could run three, four, five uh, different agents. 
And these would be agents that uh, you would probably want to know in a differential diagnosis. Are they there, and could they be contributing to the problem? And that multiplex test may cost you just an extra 10 or $20 to get results on a variety or a number of different um, agents. So that's something that you have to ask about and you need to consider when you're using this test. Now, uh, not all results are presented in this way. Some of the um, labs, uh, for example, IDEX, they will tell you whether it's a positive, a suspect, or a negative, and they won't necessarily uh, you wouldn't necessarily get a, a cycle number. And this is a thermocycler, and what it tells you is the lower the cycle number, the more of that particular agent is in the sample, the more nucleic acid that's in the sample. So in this particular situation, these happen to be cycle numbers that we use here at Wisconsin with our PCR test. And if we had a sample with a cycle number of 35 or lower in a sample that we're looking for distemper or parvo, we know that the virus or at least the nucleic acid from that virus is in there, which means that that animal from which we collected the sample was infected even if infectious virus is not present within that sample, we can still pick it up. Uh, and then there's a suspect range, and in the case of our testing, that happens to be greater than 35, less than 39. And uh, for uh, any sample that's greater than 40, we would consider that negative. Now, when I see samples up in the 38, 39 range, I'm very suspect about those and uh, I'm not uh, ready to uh, consider that they are true positives. When it's down, for example, in the 20s or uh, the low 30s, uh, then I'm convinced that that particular uh, pathogen would be present. So these numbers are not something that you want to uh, hold uh, for testing everywhere because they don't necessarily apply, but generally uh, we, we do see numbers like this. Now, how would vaccination affect the results? And we and, and uh, others uh, have been looking at that for uh, at least a, a year or so now, so we can try to answer that question. However, in general, if you can, you would want to collect samples prior to vaccination, and in the shelter, that's somewhat problematic because one of the things that I recommend and others recommend is that you should get all animals entering a shelter vaccinated, if possible, actually prior to them coming into the shelter. That would be ideal because that would give you the greatest protection, but certainly you should try to get them vaccinated as soon as possible after they enter the shelter. So you are going to, of course, have to deal with uh, a, a question like, uh, could this be vaccine virus that I'm picking up with this PCR? And it possibly could be. So uh, again, looking at our results, samples collected after vaccination, uh, we can find that they can be positive actually for up to two or more weeks with the uh, vaccine that we're using and that you would be using because all of those vaccines, distemper, parvo, adeno, they're all infectious vaccines. So if that animal is not already immune, that vaccine virus will infect the cells of that animal. It will replicate, and of course we would pick it up, and we can't uh, distinguish between vaccine virus and virulent virus, so that creates something of a problem. If you vaccinated for parvo, that vaccine parvo virus is shed in the fecal material, and that would be the sample that we're looking at 
in dogs or in cats, canine parvo or feline parvo, <clears throat> if we think we're having a parvovirus outbreak. So that uh, that's something that has to be taken into consideration. So with regard to parvo, uh, we can find that virus uh, up to two weeks and possibly in some animals it will even be present after vaccination for three weeks. So the PCR testing for parvos, for distemper, adeno, herpes, clesi, the tests are available uh, for any of these infectious agents. Uh, vaccination has to be considered. But when you, uh, of course, have animals that uh, are in the shelter that are developing disease that have been in that shelter for two uh, or three weeks already, and you're finding them positive, then you uh, know you're dealing with that particular problem, and you're also uh, able to then look at the individual animals that uh, are infected as well. <clears throat> there, there are a few uh, types of vaccines, for example, the non-infectious vaccines, which we rarely use in a shelter anyway, uh, they don't cause a PCR positive test because, of course, they don't replicate in the animal. And uh, the uh, recombinant canine distemper uh, vaccine virus, that doesn't uh, give a positive signal for distemper because that particular vaccine is just expressing some of the important immunodominant antigens of canine distemper to immunize the animal, and there is no distemper virus at all, unlike the modified live or infectious type uh, distemper vaccines where the distemper virus has to infect and replicate to immunize. Continuing with PCR testing, uh, one of the things that is really important is that you have got to be careful when collecting samples because with the high sensitivity of the test, you can easily contaminate those samples. And I have seen a situation uh, on a number of occasions where there was one infected animal, but unfortunately it was collected early in the series of individual samples, and this is when you're looking at individual animals, and then about 10 or more animals got uh, contaminated with a small amount of that sample from the infected animal, and every one of those showed up as being positive or suspect until it got diluted out. So this test is an excellent test because it is very sensitive, but it uh, is a problem because it is so very sensitive. So when collecting samples, be very careful not to contaminate. I know this might be very difficult in certain circumstances in shelters, but uh, changing gloves, for example, when you're collecting that sample, uh, that uh, might be uh, the only way you won't contaminate that sample. So how do we use this uh, PCR? Well, one of the ways that we use it is to ensure that the animal is no longer infected and shedding. And we'll talk more about that, but if we want to send that animal out for adoption or if you want it to go into a foster home, you surely don't want to be sending out a canine distemper positive or a uh, canine parvovirus positive animal. Uh, so uh, this is a really uh, valuable tool to uh, look at whether or not that animal is safe to go out. And so now we have another poll question. Yes, we have another poll question. I want to encourage everybody to get your questions in to Dr. Schultz as we go along through this presentation. If your organization utilizes a PCR testing, where do you send the results to be analyzed? IDEX laboratories, your state's diagnostic laboratory, 
VetPath Laboratory, another commercial laboratory, and we don't run PCR tests or not applicable. So get your answers in, and we'll be seeing what the audience says on this question in just a second. Um, and make sure you get your questions into Dr. Schultz. Let's look at the results. Yeah, I, I um, thought that uh, it probably would be uh, IDEX Laboratories because they have actually uh, provided some discounts uh, for PCR testing to shelters and they have a full complement of tests available. Uh, some of the state diagnostic labs are very good, and so we have some of them being used. And uh, there are other labs. A, probably a, a large number of you aren't running the test right now, and that uh, looked like it was because of the costs, and uh, I can appreciate that. Uh, very much, and uh, a fairly large segment uh, that this isn't uh, applicable. So let's move on, and um, with regard to questions, uh, I would strongly encourage you uh, to get your questions in because I think one of the most valuable things that, that uh, I would like to provide this evening would be answers to your questions. Uh, and many of you may have uh, questions about what we talk about, but you may have other questions that uh, you would like to uh, ask me. So uh, please get those questions in. So what are, of course, the uh, infectious diseases commonly seen in shelters? Well, from the standpoint of, of uh, so-called canine and feline infectious respiratory disease complex, or more commonly referred to as kennel cough and URI, or upper respiratory infections, or as I like to refer to them as the canine and feline cold, uh, these are very common. And although there are panels that can test for agents, bacteria, viruses associated with these infectious respiratory disease complex, uh, PCR is really of a limited value, as most animals will have positive samples to virtually every agent that has the potential to contribute to infectious respiratory disease complex. And the reason for that is these diseases are not just infectious agents, and it's not just a single infectious agent, and it's multiple agents, viruses, uh, ventilation, stress, and a whole variety of other things that play a key role. And that's why I refer to them as the canine and feline cold. And uh, it is my feeling that uh, we really aren't able to do much even when we have an outbreak of the infectious respiratory disease complexes. So it probably isn't all that important that we know exactly what's causing the problem because we can almost be assured that Bordetella is going to be there. We can be assured that certain of the viruses are going to be there. So that's something to keep in mind with the infectious respiratory disease complexes. Unlike single agent diseases where this diagnostic testing is very valuable and PCR is valuable. Canine distemper, the two most common outbreaks that we deal with in the shelter are, of course, distemper in the dog and canine parvovirus. Uh, and so those are the two uh, predominant ones. Now, clinically, the distemper will often start looking much like a kennel cough dog. And that's not surprising because this virus does infect the lung and it's capable of causing a kennel cough-like syndrome. So 
So that's why it often starts that way, but generally it's, of course, much more severe. And in time, you'll recognize that it's not just kennel cough, it's something much worse. It's distemper. But I don't know how many shelters uh, we find that, oh, they have some problem with kennel cough, and then not too long after that, uh, it's a canine distemper outbreak. Canine parvovirus, again, that one's a little bit easier using observation and certainly using diagnostic tests like the fecal snap to uh, diagnose that one. So that uh, probably doesn't need a PCR for diagnosis, nor does the stemper, but the PCR will work very well in making a diagnosis. More importantly, though, it'll tell you which individuals uh, are infected. Now, feline panleukopenia, like the uh, canine parvovirus, the PCR is of value, and the antigen fecal parvo snap, although designed for canine parvo, because canine parvo and feline parvo are antigenically very similar. In fact, it's believed by most that canine parvo was a mutation of the feline parvo that occurred back in the late 1970s to cause the uh, disease to appear, because prior to that time, there never was a canine parvo two virus, and so it was an entirely new infection in 1978, uh, originated here in the United States, but quickly spread worldwide. And of course, uh, you know, uh, once these types of diseases appear, very, very difficult to get rid of them. So we're not going to see parvo go away very quickly. Diseases or infections to test for in the shelter, I'm sure some of you or many of you may be uh, looking for feline leukemia virus or feline immune deficiency virus, positive cats. Uh, it's important to know that status, especially if you're going to uh, be adopting the cat because it uh, really isn't fair to adopt a cat out uh, that is positive for either of these viruses uh, without the uh, adoptee knowing that they are infected. I don't know how many of you happen to use the IDEX4DX test, but again, I think from the standpoint of the adopted animal, it would be very useful for either you uh, in the shelter to do the testing or recommend that the adoptee does the testing to know whether that animal is heartworm or lichia or anaplasma or even Borrelia. That's Borrelia, uh, which is Lyme disease positive, because that's all critical to the health of that animal and the well-being of it. And so that is something that uh, the owner uh, should know, and of course, if it uh, can be treated like uh, heartworm can be treated, uh, Ehrlichia anaplasma or Lyme can be treated, but the animals have to go in onto uh, a regimen of uh, antibiotic for some time, that should be done uh, immediately. In the IDEX fecal parvo snap, we've already talked about and how that can be used, but we'll talk more about it as we move through these various diseases. So what do the tests tell you? Well, uh, again, if we're doing uh, tests for distemper, unless uh, we're looking at an animal under 16 weeks of age and that animal has antibody for distemper, that means the animal is immune. Now, I think all of you are well aware that the younger animal is most likely to have that antibody as a result of the maternally derived antibody they receive through the colostrum during the first few days of life. 
And so the animal really needs to be 16, 18 weeks or more of age before we can say that that antibody positive animal is protected from distemper. And it's not so much the uh, titer of the antibody, it's really whether or not the animal is actively immunized or actively immune, and then that uh, antibody really does demonstrate protection. And we spend too much time worrying about what the number is, and the number is really very important if we're looking at passive antibody, whether that passive antibody can provide any protection. However, if the animal is actively immune, it will have T cells and B cells that uh, are producing this antibody. And if the animal has a low antibody titer and they would see the virus, that immune system would turn on immediately and can control the infection if it even occurred. And so that's what um, we're really expecting to see in an actively immunized animal. And so if the titer happens to be run by a titer test and it's 32 and the lab says, well, you need a 64, or if it's 16, you need a 32, you really don't if that's active immunity. That animal will be protected, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. If you do a PCR and it's distemper positive, that animal is very likely infected. There's uh, very little chance that it's not infected. So antibody positive and PCR, well, the virus was present, but the antibody had developed, and that virus may be neutralized. And we see that in animals that are challenged that are already vaccinated. And if you take that sample that shows that there's virus there, you cannot isolate virus because it's not alive. Uh, it's really neutralized. But the nucleic acid is there, and it's still being picked up. So there's, so there's some uh, um, interpretation issues that come into uh, using the PCR correctly and interpreting it correctly. Now, one of the things that you can do to help reduce the cost when using PCR if, for example, you want to know in a group of dogs, are those dogs infected, you can take nasal swabs and you can actually pool the swabs and see whether or not you've got a positive. Obviously, if you want to know about the individual, you can't do that. But frequently, when we want to know uh, initially, is this distemper, is this parvo, what is going on? That's where uh, pooling works quite well. And we, we do it often as we're looking at groups of animals to know whether or not they're still infected or not. And uh, taking a, a pool of five or taking a pool of ten, it does help uh, save on the cost of the testing. Same thing with uh, fecal swabs for parvo. So dogs infected with distemper, uh, as I mentioned earlier, they may be showing some signs of kennel cough, but they really are infected with distemper. And uh, the incubation period, it's really important, and I think most of you are aware now, that uh, it can be up to six weeks. And with a lot of the biotypes that are around uh, and causing diseases in uh, shelters today, I good number of them do have incubation periods of as long as six weeks. The shortest the incubation period for any of the biotypes of distemper uh, will be is two weeks. So anywhere from two to six weeks. This makes it very difficult to deal with distemper. And uh, not uncommonly, uh, what happens is you have an outbreak you think that animal is uh, normal, hadn't shown any clinical signs during the period of the outbreak. 
uh, and uh, you think that uh, adopting it will not be a problem. And then two weeks after it gets into the new home, it comes down with full-blown distemper or it comes down with uh, neurologic distemper, and that that's a, a difficult uh, situation when that happens and not much that can be done about it uh, unless you were actually testing. And you would know, for example, if you did PCR, that animal would definitely have been a PCR-positive animal. It just hadn't yet expressed any of the uh, clinical signs because of that long incubation period. So PCR helps to avoid some of those kinds of situations. Incubation period up to six weeks, PCR positive, no clinical signs, as I've just said. Cats and dogs with parvoviruses, feline panleukopenia, canine parvo. Here, it's much easier because the incubation period is very short, three to four days. At the maximum, it would be up to seven days, and that's a rare event. So uh, PCR positive really is positive, and we have a lot more success uh, in controlling parvo outbreaks in both canine and feline species than we do actually the distemper outbreaks. They're, they're harder for us to deal with. But I can tell you that we have in uh, a number of shelters now by using antibody tests for distemper and using PCR for distemper including some pooling of samples, we've been able to uh, uh, really control uh, the distemper. Uh, we can, with the antibody, test animals, especially on-site antibody tests. As the animals are coming into the shelter, if we find that they're antibody positive, we have no uh, concern about putting them right in where the outbreak is occurring because they're protected. If the animals are not antibody positive, we will try to have those particular dogs fostered and not even go into the shelter or the shelters that uh, have the luxury of having some uh, place to isolate and put that animal to give it a chance to respond to the vaccine, we'll do that. But I know a lot of the shelters that we work with do not have that uh, that kind of isolation facility where we can do that. So this is where using uh, the, uh, the diagnostics we have available, we can uh, get these outbreaks uh, under control and we know which animals can and can't go into those environments where there are infected animals. So. The parvo with the incubation period being the three to seven days, uh, as I said before, it's a lot easier dealing with uh, with those particular outbreaks and, and uh, bringing them under control. So PCR positive animals do not adopt these animals, hold them until they're PCR negative. Uh, you can use PCR to ensure the animal is no longer infected and shedding. And when collecting the samples, uh, as I've said before, and just as uh, a review, be very careful to not con cross contaminate the samples if you're wanting to look at the individual animal. And again, we don't have any tests that are more sensitive. Let's look now at the antibody testing that can be performed by a diagnostic lab or by the in-house on-site tests that are available. And clearly, diagnostic labs perform these tests all the time, and they have the gold standards in place to look, for example, at serum neutralizing antibody to distemper or to adenovirus. Uh, tests available for antibody to rabies and parvo and virtually anything you want to test for. Uh, you have the laboratory test and for some of the important diseases that contribute to outbreaks in shelters, 
we have the on-site test. Uh, so we've we've got almost everything available. This is an example of a, a plate where they are doing a virus neutralization test, and those wells that are purple, there was antibody in those samples that was diluted out, and it protected the cells, which when stained turned purple, protected them from being destroyed by the virus. So that's your titer. You can read your titer down there, whereas these two, and you usually run it in duplicate, these two, uh, same sample, no antibody whatsoever, antibody uh, for a number of dilutions, and usually they're doubling dilutions. So that's how you get that 1 to 2, 1 to 4, 8, 16, 32 titers. It's doubling dilutions. One of the things to always remember about a titer Generally, it is not that specific number. For example, if I give you a 1 to 8 titer, it's usually somewhere between one dilution above and one dilution below. So that titer of 8 is somewhere between 4 and 16. Uh, that seems okay, but then when I have titers, for example, of 5,000, the dilution before 5,000 would be 2,500, and the one after 5,000 is 10,000. And when you hear that the titer is somewhere between 1 in 2,500 and 1 in 10,000, you think, boy, that's not a very good test. But it's the same as the difference between the 4 and the 16 when the titer was 8. So that's that's always... Uh, a point of confusion with regard to these titers. This is just an example of a hemagglutination test. And here we have hemagglutination. Here it is inhibited from agglutinating. So that means that this is an antibody positive well and this is an antibody negative well because when there's antibody you don't get any agglutination. You inhibit the hemagglutination, and that's how you would read those particular uh, wells and titers. The in-house or on-site test for antibody, we've got two that are commercially available. Uh, they're both used uh, by many uh, shelters to uh, test for antibody. They're used uh, even in a variety of labs where samples can be sent and they would be tested by these particular procedures. Uh, the titer check is a test that looks just at antibody to distemper and parvo, whereas the VAXI check is a test that can measure antibody to distemper, canine distemper, canine parvo, and canine adeno. And uh, that's for the dog. The company that makes that test is also uh, working on developing a test for the cat, but the cat test is not yet licensed or available. And we have just a, a few slides here uh, uh, that will come after the poll, but the on-site test then uh, are uh, two very useful commercial tests that uh, can measure antibody to those particular agents. And these tests have been correlated with gold standard type tests. So that's important to understand. So now we have another poll question. Yes, we have another poll question. Um, does your organization use on-site tests as a diagnostic tool? Yes, we love them. Yes, but we are confused about how to interpret them sometimes. No, we would like to, but we don't have the funding. No, we don't see a lot of disease in our organization. And not applicable. Now, while you're answering this poll question, 
I wanted to let you know that we've had a lot of questions come in for Dr. Schultz. We may not get that to, to all of them uh, during the Q&A session, but we will publish a Q&A document on our website, www.maddiesinstitute.org, and it will be up as soon as possible after this webcast, so keep checking back. All right, we're going to look at our poll results. Okay, wow, that's some oh, good results, good. Dr. Schultz. Yeah, that's that's very good. And I'm pleased that uh, you don't necessarily have to love them, but you could at least like them, and it looks like <laughs> you really like them, so that's good. So let's let's move on so we, we have some... Uh, time then to get through the rest of uh, the presentation. So these on-site tests, you are using them, so you're familiar with them. Uh, we've got some pictures here of, of uh, some of them, and uh, they really do uh, work well, and they help you determine whether or not that animal really does have immunity or not. So they are uh, useful. The, the uh, Last slide happened to be the microplate uh, uh, format that is titer check, and this is the immunocomb. And for those of you who use it, you know what it uh, what it does, how it works, and so forth. It can run one sample, and uh, each of these teeth on the immunocomb has the distemper parvo and adeno all on them. So you would have three dots if you had antibody to each of those three viruses. So it's kind of neat that you can get an, an answer immediately with regard to those three agents. And this, this particular test is also very useful in practices where you're looking uh, at uh, an animal that has come in for its annual wellness exam, and you want to know do they have immunity to the vaccines they have received uh, last year or five years ago or ten years ago? This test will very nicely tell you that. This is a, a single strip out of the 96-well plate that we're doing a titer check on here, and you can see the color uh, changes, and uh, that test works well, too. It, it's a little bit... Uh, uh, more difficult to uh, do than the the vaxi check, uh, but people that uh, are trained on it and and become accustomed to it can uh, do it quite well. Almost anyone can do this particular test, and it takes about uh, 25 minutes to get a result uh, with this uh, particular test. So that's a another advantage. It doesn't take very long to know whether or not that sample has antibody or doesn't have antibody. And here are those those spots. Um, this particular uh, test was negative for antibody to one of the three. This one's positive for all three. So, And here would be the same sort of thing, positives and negatives in the two different tests. So serum antibody does correlate with protection from certain diseases. If you uh, have uh, any concern about canine adenovirus 1, which is the cause of infectious canine hepatitis, much more uh, prevalent is a disease out of the United States than in the United States. But with that said, I want to uh, tell you that uh, just uh, about six months ago, I would have told you you don't have too much to worry about it, and uh, you want to make sure that all dogs are vaccinated with the canine adenovirus 2 vaccine. And we do have the virus on our southern border. It's in Mexico, and there are plenty of dogs dying down there from canine adeno 1 or infectious canine hepatitis. And we know that there are still wildlife in Canada that are being diagnosed with adeno 1. It causes, for example, in the fox, an encephalitis instead of kidney and uh, liver disease, which it causes in dogs. Now, with that said, 
about uh, four months ago, we actually have had an outbreak here in the States, in Massachusetts. Uh, we are not certain, but we believe that it probably came some, from some infected wildlife, probably the fox. And these particular dogs that got the infection had not been vaccinated with canine adeno 2. So they got infected and developed typical infectious canine hepatitis. And let me tell you, this is a severe disease. It can kill over 50% of puppies under uh, about 16 to 20 uh, weeks of age. It can uh, certainly kill adult dogs that don't have antibody. The ADNO2 vaccine is excellent, but you've got to use it for protection. And these particular puppies were not vaccinated. And we're still testing them because one of the things about the adenovirus, it can uh, establish itself in the kidney. And uh, we're at about, uh, as I say, about four months out right now. And uh, we're still picking the virus up in, in the urine. So these dogs continue to shed that adeno-1 virus. So... Uh, we we didn't think it was uh, totally gone, but we were uh, getting a bit complacent, I think, that it uh, was going to uh, rear its ugly head again, and it has reared its ugly head. But with that said, uh, I've always been a strong component of ADNO2 vaccine, not only to, even if there wasn't an ADNO1 around, ADNO2 uh, is one of the most important of the viruses that can cause severe uh, respiratory disease or kennel cough. So ADNO2 is something uh, that you also want to protect dogs against because it is capable of causing severe respiratory disease or uh, kennel cough. So what uh, does antibody mean to ADNO1? Well, it is a good correlation with protection against distemper, good correlation with parvo, good correlation. Rabies, a good correlation. The only thing is uh, we're not allowed to use it in lieu of revaccination because that's a regulation. And there is a Lyme antibody test called a Borrelia Cytal test that also correlates well with protection against um, Borrelia or the Lyme bacterium. Uh, when in the cat, the best correlations would be panleukopenia or feline parvo and rabies. There is a correlation with antibody and Khaleesi virus immunity. The only thing is it isn't serum antibody, it's instead local mucosal antibody in the upper respiratory tract. And that's difficult to collect, but if you did collect it and ran a test and demonstrated that you had antibody, that would correlate quite well with protection against feline Khaleesi virus, one of the major causes along with uh, feline viral rhinotracheitis or feline herpes virus with regard to feline respiratory disease complex. So the detection then of antibody as a result of infection or uh, vaccination, so either infection or vaccination, really does demonstrate, as I mentioned earlier, if you're doing titers, it demonstrates that there was both B and T cell immunity because it takes T cells to even get B cell immunity. And those T cells happen to be of a type that contribute to cell-mediated immunity by producing a substance known as gamma interferon. These titers also tell you that you have immunologic memory. If you're doing titers over a period of years and you haven't been vaccinating and you still have antibody there, you know that that animal has immunologic memory. And that memory is being shown in the form of antibody that's being produced by what are known as long-lived plasma cells. They were induced by the vaccine, 
and they live for a long period of time even uh, without overt antigenic stimulation. So uh, antibody titers are very useful for certain diseases, but not all diseases, and that's that's important to understand because we've already talked about antibodies that instead of give you an indication of protection, they tell you the animal had been infected or is infected. But for others, that antibody really tells you that the animal is protected, and I can't emphasize that more. Okay, with regard to uh, testing, when using the antibody test, of course, you can demonstrate vaccinal immunity, so it's uh, important from that standpoint. If you're vaccinating the animal two or more weeks after you give that last puppy dose which should be at 14 to 16 weeks or older, you can do a titer test and know whether the vaccine has or hasn't worked. That's very useful medically to know that. You then know that that animal is indeed protected. The majority of them should be if that last dose is at 14 to 16 weeks, but there are some animals that have enough maternally derived antibody that even at that age, there's a small percentage that the vaccine cannot immunize because it's neutralized by that maternally derived antibody. So doing the antibody test, you can tell whether your animal is in fact immune as a result of vaccination. Antibody testing also uh, very important to check to make sure that they continue to have that immunity. And if you want to test them, uh, I don't recommend doing antibody testing any more often than every three years after you know the animal is immune at a year. And that's the same as what we, va we would recommend vaccinating, not more often than every three years after you know the animal has been actively immunized when we're talking about distemper, parvo, and adeno in the dog, or you're talking about parvo or panleukopenia in the, the cat. Calician herpes, the antibody, as I've already said, is not as meaningful with regard to protection. Testing in kennels and shelters, I've already alluded to how we can use it when we have an outbreak to know whether or not that animal, if it is an animal over like 16, 18, 20 weeks of age, that we're not looking at maternal antibody and we're looking at active antibody to know whether or not it would be safe to put it into that uh, contaminated or infected environment. So the, infective, the effective control of infectious disease, vaccinate with the core vaccines immediately upon entry. This is what I mentioned earlier, and that can sometimes give us some difficulties in interpreting the PCR test if we do have an outbreak because many of these antibodies or many of these uh, animals will have uh, positive PCR results for the vaccine viruses. Infectious outbreaks then uh, can be prevented and they can be controlled without using uh, or euthanizing large numbers of dogs using things like PCR and antibody testing, and, and we've been doing it now uh, for uh, a number of years, and it's working uh, quite nicely. And so what does it mean then, antibody positive plus PCR positive? Well, the virus was present and the antibody is present, and we have actually demonstrated that this can happen. It's confusing but uh, usually that uh, agent is not infectious. Outbreaks, we recommend not adopting any of the animals that really are PCR positive and hold them until they become negative. That would also be true if you were using a fecal snap instead of a PCR testing feces. And as long as that particular snap test was positive, don't 
obviously uh, send those animals out until it becomes negative. Again, to stress the fact that you can pool samples, reduce costs, and use this test very effectively as a diagnostic through the pooling. Again, it has the disadvantage of not knowing about the individual animal, but it's more for diagnosis. And finally, uh, the vaccines, and I couldn't give a presentation without talking about vaccines. So uh, what are the shelter core vaccines for the dog? I think everyone knows that we have identified the same uh, core vaccines for a shelter dog as we have for a pet dog, but we've added some um, other another virus and uh, some uh, and a bacteria. So every dog should be vaccinated with distemper parvo and adeno. In the shelter, we're recommending canine parainfluenza as well, mainly because of the high prevalence in most shelters of both canine and feline respiratory disease complex. So the five-way combo would be the one that you would be using most often in shelters to get that immunity to distemper parvo adeno. Unfortunately, the immunity conferred by giving an injection of canine parainfluenza virus is not really as effective as giving that canine parainfluenza intranasally. So. As you can see, we're also recommending as core vaccines abortatella with canine parainfluenza if you really want to have good protection against canine parainfluenza. And that particular product is given intranasally. And I know that with some animals that's somewhat problematic and so you may end up only giving the canine parainfluenza through injection. And then we now have a Bordetella vaccine that can be given orally. And it's a Bordetella only vaccine. And a lot of folk who are having difficulty giving it intranasally, and there's a Bordetella only that is available internasally as well, they're finding it much easier to give it orally. Now, if both of these fail, the intranasal and the oral, then I would recommend the injectable, but only then because we and others have good information that demonstrates that the intranasal is the best because you can include both the viruses, and this also comes as a combination with adeno-2, parainfluenza, and bordetella. But bordetella given intranasally and orally is much more effective in controlling bordetella than when it's given by injection. But with that said, if you can't give it by this route, then there will be benefit, not as great a benefit, but there will be some benefit and it will be better than not vaccinating to control Bordetella. And Bordetella is a key player, obviously, in canine respiratory disease complex. Feline, the core vaccines are Parvo, Khaleesi, and Herpes. And the two that play a key role, of course, in respiratory disease are the Khaleesi and herpes, but panleukopenia can even play a key role because it can cause some immune suppression, making that animal more susceptible to the agents that are involved. And there are bacteria and other agents besides just these viruses. And then at adoption, one of the things that I would like for those of you in the audience that are involved in shelter work is considering for both dogs and cats, giving a three-year rabies vaccine at the time of adoption to improve public health 
and to ensure that that animal will have at least three years of protection against rabies, and hopefully during that time uh, the new owners will make sure that it's revaccinated. But giving a rabies vaccine, a three-year rabies product now, just one dose of it, I know that doesn't follow the regulations of the state, but I'm not talking about regulatory medicine now. I'm talking about protection and a rabies vaccine when given one dose. It will provide, if it's a three-year product, three years of protection. And I think that that would be something that uh, really would enhance public health and protection against rabies. Well, okay, thank that, you, Dr. Schultz. Thank you. That's the, that was a very good presentation. We do have time for some questions, um, and I will push the first question up on the slide so our audience can see it. Is it still recommended to keep recovered parvo puppies isolated for another two weeks after treatment due to intermittent, intermittent virus shedding, even if they received an exit bath and a, test, a parvo test negative? If it is possible to keep them uh, isolated, that would be uh, really as effective a measure as you could take to really ensure that no uh, infectious virus was going out on that particular animal or with that animal. So, um, yes, uh, it would probably, under optimal conditions, be what uh, uh, you should do. But we're finding when it's not done, we have not uh, had too much trouble. We haven't had uh, problems with it. So I would say the answer uh, would be yes if you were in a position to do that. I would not uh, stop doing it. Okay. Dr. Schultz, can you comment, comment on whether any tests are useful to characterize uh, specific pathogens responsible for canine respiratory disease complex? Tracheal wash and suction with culture-sensitive testing to determine optimal treatment in very sick dogs. Yeah, that that uh, uh, would certainly have uh, some benefit if your uh, standard treatments are not uh, working very well and if you want to see whether or not there are bacteria there that are playing a, an important role. Um, frequently, you will have uh, a variety of, of bacteria that can play a role. Pasteurella can play a role. Streptococci can play a role. Bordetella clearly will uh, be able to play a role in the disease. But uh, you uh, uh, can have one of, one of the most severe uh, uh, types of, of infectious respiratory disease complex or kennel cough that we see, uh, we often uh, will isolate from those animals, and, and uh, they actually, some of them will die from it. We isolate hemolytic E. coli, and it's not un, uncommon for the E. coli to play a key role in infectious respiratory disease complex. And part of it uh, is if there is any kind of uh, uh, situation where you have power washing and uh, aerosolizing the fecal bacteria into the nose of animals, which I have seen happen and I'm sure others have seen happen even without a power washer and just a hose, that uh, can contribute to very severe Cases. You're not going to have outbreaks per se, but you're going to have very severe cases where those uh, organisms are, are causing uh, severe disease. So if you're uh, using culture sensitivity and so forth to determine what um, you should be using to treat, that would be, uh, again, of, 
of benefit. The other thing, of course, you know that there are many, many viruses that are playing a role in canine respiratory disease complex, uh, in addition to, of course, the parainfluenza and the adeno. We have canine respiratory corona that's there. We have a new virus that was uh, identified in 2011, a canine pneumovirus. We don't know what role it's playing. It doesn't seem to be playing a primary role, but certainly could be playing a secondary role. We've got mycoplasma like mycoplasma cyanos playing roles. We've got about uh, 20 different agents uh, that uh, can be there causing uh, canine infectious respiratory disease complex. You say that PCR is a value for diagnosing canine distemper virus, but what if the animals have been vaccinated? doesn't make any difference. If they have been vaccinated and they're protected, then you don't have to worry about them coming down with canine distemper virus. But if you're picking up canine distemper virus in a dog that's showing clinical signs, that vaccinated animal is not immunized and the virus is infecting. Are there any tests so that, or precautions? That's why I talked about antibody versus PCR and what, uh, what you need to consider. But that PCR really does tell you that uh, the virus was there, and if it's showing clinical signs, you know it's uh, there. Even if it's not, it could still be shedding because you could be going through that incubation period. Remember that long incubation uh, period that uh, we have to deal with uh, in distemper. That's why I say we have some greater difficulty dealing with a distemper outbreak than we ever do with a parvo outbreak. Sorry for that, Lynn. Oh, no problem. Are there any tests or precautions that can be taken to minimize the risk of feline infectious peritonitis um, in a cage-free cat shelter? Do you recommend treating I, animals who are in, uh, are in the suspect PCR range? Yeah, I wish there, uh, I could answer that. I, I don't know what uh, can be done to, to minimize that risk. And... Uh, uh, I'm not sure what uh, what they are thinking about as far as treatment uh, of suspect animals with regard to PCR range. I, I assume they're not talking about FIP there, but I'm not I'm not sure uh, exactly what uh, what that uh, question is. So hopefully we'll have some clarification of it, and I'll be able to answer it at a later time. But uh, no, with regard to FIP, uh, that's a difficult one. And, of course, uh, everyone knows that uh, uh, it's a specific variant uh, of the corona that has the ability to cause that uh, immune-mediated disease, and it really is an immune-mediated disease that's triggered by that coronavirus. Okay, the next question is, if I give a cat a Pfizer combination vaccination, then run swabs, uh, ocular and uh, florange, uh, you'll have to say that one for me, 24 Pharyngeal. hours, Pharyngeal. 24 Pharyngeal. hours later, okay, <laughs> will the vaccine cause my IDEX FERD PCR to be positive as a result of a recent infection? Uh, if you give the, the cat a Pfizer combination vaccination uh, or anybody else's, uh, let's not pick just on, on Pfizer, but um, could, it, could it become positive uh, for things like uh, your herpes and Khaleesi and Panluc that was uh, in it? Uh, the answer is yes, it can become positive. And uh, 24 hours would be just uh, about enough time uh, for that that uh, vaccine virus to replicate. And of course, whenever you're dealing with an infectious virus, as you are with all of these uh, core vaccines, they have to infect and they will infect to immunize, but at the same time, you would then pick them up uh, using PCR. Okay, let's look at the next question. Um, 
If the collar on the tighter check is less than the control, will the animal still raise an immune response if challenged because it has developed some color in the spot and the henny, and hence, which can be assumed to have some antibodies? Uh, I would say that there is a possibility, but not a uh, very strong probability that uh, that would happen. So if your titer check is showing less than the control, uh, could it cause a, a rise uh, in an infected animal? It could, but that rise wouldn't necessarily provide protection quickly enough to prevent disease. So one of the things that um, is a little bit uh, confusing and uh, creates some difficulty in interpretation, for example, if you have an animal that is infected with parvovirus and uh, you haven't seen any clinical signs yet because it was only about three days since infection, that animal will frequently develop a, an antibody response by like about four days that you can pick up on these tests, but it is an antibody response that occurs too late to control the virus, and then that antibody-positive animal comes down with clinical disease, and that creates some difficulty for you because you're wondering why your antibody-positive animal got infected. Well, they got infected, made that antibody. You happened to test for the antibody right at that time, and they're about within the next 24 to 48 hours to come down with signs of clinical disease. Not very many animals like that, but I can tell you they exist. And uh, we just had one uh, in an outbreak uh, recently, and uh, they were very upset because it was an antibody-positive cat and it got disease, and they were, were concerned about that because they were using the antibody to determine whether or not the animal was protected or not, and it came down with disease even though it was antibody positive. But if, if you look at the timeline, the cat uh, had, had just been infected about two days earlier, uh, and then it made antibody. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lynn Fridley, Program Coordinator for Maddie's Institute. The topic of our webcast is Cracking the Infection Control Code, Using and Interpreting Diagnostic Tests to Control Infectious Diseases in Shelters. At Maddie's Institute, we are committed to helping you find innovative, humane, and effective ways to keep animals happy and healthy while preparing them for placement in a new home. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Ronald Schultz the founder and chair of the Department of Pathobiological Science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Veterinary Medicine. He was the first president of the American Association of Veterinary Immunologists, as well as a member of a number of veterinary vaccine task forces, including the American Animal Hospital Association's Canine Vaccine Task Force and the American Association of Feline Practitioners, Feline Vaccine Task Force. 
Dr. Schultz also heads up Maddie's Laboratory for, diagnos for Diagnosis and Prevention of Shelter Diseases, where he's putting his experience and knowledge to work helping America's homeless dogs and cats. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping items that we need to cover. First, 10 audience members will be chosen in a random drawing for a door prize. Each will receive a copy of Maddie's Infection Control Manual. We will contact the winners via email, so good luck. Next, please take a look at the left-hand 